Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion, and the beautiful Katie. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. We are in the Detroit area today, and we thought, hey, there is a person that, you know, I heard about a lot of their history living in Los Angeles for as long as I did, and it was a very sad, untimely death. I'm talking about Jay Sebring, who, well, I think a lot of people know the story. We're gonna visit his final resting place today. Days with Jordan the Lion and the beautiful Katie. It begins right now. Very nice cemetery. I really like this one. So he's buried out here in section 24, but there's no real markers and there's no real good photos online of where he's at. So we're just going to have to do some looking. If you want to come out and find JC bring yourself, this is section 24. This is the road that goes up beside 24. Look for this headstone and it's directly behind it. Borowskis. Katie's already over there paying her respects. Thomas John Cummer is not the name that he would ultimately probably be remembered by. We know him as J.C. Bring, and even today, all these years after his passing, it's sad that he's primarily known for the horrible way in which he passed, as opposed to what he brought to the world, which was he changed an entire industry of men's style. See, Thomas John Cummer was raised here in Highland Park, outside of Detroit. And even as a young kid, he had, he just kind of marched to his own beat of his own drum. You know, his parents were very orderly, but he just didn't really listen very well. And his family put out a documentary kind of talking about his life and giving a little bit more insight into who Thomas John Cummer was. And he said that one of his early, I guess one of the defining moments of his life and that, uh, that leadership role that he would end up having throughout his life was that he forged his father's signature so that he could enlist in the U.S. Navy in 1950 before he was old enough to. And when his father found out what he had done, Instead of stopping him, he actually thought maybe this was a good idea. I tend to believe from reading and, and the documentary and everything about Jay Sebring or Thomas John Cummers that he probably did this looking at it as a way of having to not listen to his parents anymore and going off and having his own life. But of course, going into the Navy, you have to live a pretty orderly life your your days are planned out for you and he would have a lot of trouble with that it seems the guys in his group in the navy with him loved him they said he was everybody i mean pretty much throughout his life would talk about how likable he was as a person everybody liked him right away and he would while he was in the u.s navy he would just decide that he wanted to go on a vacation to see his family for Christmas or he would decide that he wanted to go out to Los Angeles and check out a jazz club so he would just go AWOL and it wasn't like they had to go and bring him back he would just stay out for a few extra days than he had permission for and then he would eventually come back. It was actually his time in the US Navy when he started cutting hair. He didn't like the haircuts that they gave and he you know for some reason had this idea that he could see how hair was supposed to look. Not like 
the way a barber sees it where it's a here's a hairstyle and you just put it on a person he would actually look at the person's face their hair texture things like that and then he would create a whole new look based off of the way he saw them and made a style that was just perfect for them he would cut his own hair and then would start cutting the other guys in the navy's hair and then eventually he was out no surprise that thomas john Cummer, just from what i've told you would not make a career in the military so he came out and went back home to detroit and just didn't see a future there so he decided to go out to los angeles and try and do something there he never wanted to be a barber. He said that many times. He had no intentions of what he was doing um, as being a barber. He wanted to style. And so he went to cosmetology school and eventually hit up his father for a loan so that he could lease his own space. And he was going to start doing these hairstyles that he envisioned. And uh, boy, was he successful eventually from it. He was still going by Thomas John Cummer or Tom Cummer or sometimes TJ Cummer, but he was dating Barbara Luna, who would eventually end up on Star Trek. And he was dating her at the time, and she said that he just kind of thought at the time when he got the lease and everything, this was like 1959, that his name just didn't have like a star quality punch to it. And so she said he was always into car racing and she heard him say Sebring a couple of times and said, what about that? What about Jay Sebring as a name? So that's what he ended up going with, naming his salon after. And then he would eventually get, even though he was the only one working in there, Barbara would say she would sweep up hair and everything to help out, but he was really the only employee until Larry Geller um, eventually walked in. Larry said, I didn't know if this was a barber shop or what this place was, but when I walked in, he said, I met Jay and he just kind of told me, don't be like everybody else. Don't be a barber. Do what I'm doing. Men's styling. And so Jay, he had this theory. He would look at someone's hair. He would look at their facial structure. He would look at the hair as like a frame to a, a beautiful painting. And then he said the third thing he would look at is what their their lot in life was, what their social, what they were trying to project or, you know, what their their job was and so they weren't real successful at first but Barbara said that she knew Vic Damone and talked Vic Damone into coming in and getting a haircut and Vic Damone said it was life-changing he said until then I didn't realize I'd never really had a haircut Jay would shampoo the hair start fresh so that he wasn't influenced by whatever the style was before and then he would just give you a look that was unique unto you and Vic Damone paid him a hundred bucks, which in those days was unthought of. I mean, we're talking like 1959, 60, and Vic Damone started telling everyone he knew about Jay Sebring. And then Jay got hooked up with the Rat Pack and Paul Anka, and they continued to tell people about him. He was getting hired to go do hair on movie sets, and he got to know everybody, Larry Geller, who he would teach his method to. See, Jay had this whole method that he had over the years came up with and his plan was he wanted to teach other students this method. It was gonna go all across the world, you know, kind of like the way we would know Vidal Sassoon and Paul Mitchell, there would be this whole method. You could go to a school for it. There would be products for it. He really foresaw what the business would eventually end up becoming and he started all of that. So Larry Geller ended up being the personal stylist for Elvis for all those movie years. And, and then even after Jay's style and Jay's technique would be what st styled Elvis's hair. But beyond that, he even worked with the biggest names in the business from Henry Fonda to Paul Newman. Um, he wanted to learn karate at one point. So he found Ed Parker, and then when Ed Parker would do his demonstrations, he introduced Bruce Lee, and Jay saw Bruce Lee and introduced Bruce to studio heads and producers and ended up getting Bruce into the movie. Well, not movies, but he got him into television. He got him into the Green Hornet, which then eventually got Bruce more recognized in the movies. And he was doing Bruce's hair, and they had a deal. Um, 
Bruce's wife Linda said that Bruce would teach Jay karate in return for his haircuts. And so Jay was the the man to the stars. And people just loved loved him. So they loved his style, but then they loved being in the, the chair with him, the vibe that he gave off, how how you felt when you got out of his chair, you felt like you were he had given you a persona almost people would describe. And so it was sad, you know, that we would end up knowing him from these senseless murders. Katie and I were over here looking for Jay. We had, you know, there's so much ground to cover and to look around. It's a big, big cemetery, but I told her, I said, you know, one thing I know for sure is that he will have a lot of people that had visited his grave. So we want to look for one that has a lot of stuff. And one of the things that she had told me was that she said she thought she knew you said you thought some of the stuff was glued to the headstone, and sure enough, how'd you hear about that? You know what? I have to give one of our best buddies, Mr. Scott Michaels, full credit for that because I- Oh, did he glue him down? No, he, <laughs> he actually mentioned it in his vlog that someone had done that, so that's what I remembered. Yeah, there's uh, that, that, and there's a little cross up there up top that's also been added and glued down. Rosary. Yeah, what a sad case. I mean, what a sad story, I guess you would say. Now, even though it goes down kind of in history that Jay Sebring madly was in love with Sharon Tate and they had a long relationship, he actually had a wife before and he met her in like 1960, started dating, and they were married for several years. And uh, she said the reason it didn't work out was because he was just so busy, she felt like she never had time with him. And uh, even when she would do interviews for the family documentary, she teared up and said it was the biggest mistake of her life was asking him for a divorce. She said that she had people in her ear that were kind of like telling her that she should do that, but she said, really, if we just had more time together, I think I, I had everything I would have wanted. And so you can tell that she really somewhat feels guilty for what ended up happening to him. But after she ends up divorcing Jay, um, he ends up meeting Sharon. Now he was kind of a playboy. He was a playboy, very popular with the ladies before his wife and then a little bit after. But he was heartbroken when his marriage ended until he met Sharon. Apparently Sharon had a just this allure that people everybody fell in love with her when they met her. You, just like Jay, apparently. You know, if you met him, you liked him right away. And so those two got together, they were inseparable, and it seemed like almost the perfect pair, and dated for three years. They were engaged. Some people say they weren't engaged, but I think that they were. And she went off to make a movie. She went over to visit the producer, met the director and then during the filming of the movie they fell in love and she had to tell jay when she finished making the movie that now she was in love with roman polanski instead of him and you would think that would just absolutely destroy someone which it sounds like it did but he was somehow able to put on a put on like a um, a friendly face and say you know i want to be part of both your lives anyway and he went and met Roman and gave his approval for Roman and they were all friends. But then his neighbors, Jay's neighbors in his neighborhood say that you could see Jay and Sharon walking around all the time while she was engaged or even uh, married to Roman in those times, you would see Jay and Sharon walking around holding hands. So in early August of 1969, a group of friends after coming home from dinner were slain in the house that Sharon was living in up on Cielo Drive. When something like this happens and no one knows who did it, immediately seemed like the media started to pick apart the lives of the victims and try and find out what it was in their life that could have perpetuated something like this. And they really just um, came up with all kinds of theories and speculation into Jay's life that were really not fair. Um, the family brings that up a lot in the documentary that that's one of the things that 
his mother was never able to get over. She kept every clipping about his career while he was alive, but as soon as he died, they started picking apart his life or reputable magazines like Time Magazine would run articles claiming all kinds of things from the scene and have no one attributed to the article none of the fact none of the things that they said were actually facts that were correct and so people believed all of this stuff and then eventually they found out that it was you know this madman Charles Manson and his family and that they had done this and they went on trial they were found guilty and given the death penalty and then the death penalty was repealed in 1972 so that's just more salt in the wound of the family but sadly you know the family when they had to do these trials they had to hear all of the details and in the end what it sounds like really this all came down to this murder it was it was not because they had done anything Charles Manson had this family of followers that um, he could get to do anything he wanted. And he was uh, wanting to be a musician, wasn't having any luck at it. And they believe that he knew Terry Melcher lived at that house at one point. Uh, he had been up there since Terry moved, so he knew that Terry didn't live there anymore. He had actually, Jay Sebring had escorted him off the property, told him that Terry didn't live there anymore. So he knew. But uh, he had the family go up and do it anyway. It's believed to be a way of sending a message to Terry. Like, hey, kill these innocent people or we had these innocent people killed at a place you used to live in. That, take that as a warning. And in the trial, they painted it as though it was the beginning of a race war. That was the, the plan of it or that was the, the idea behind it. Sadly, for years and years and years, because of the death penalty being repealed the family of the victims have to constantly go and fight to have the parole denied and you know sadly as we know now one of them was actually released recently so it's a bummer i mean it's it's sad because jay wanted to jay wanted to have his name and his technique as something that was across the world and men's styling has you know become a huge industry but sadly after he passed away it appears his business partners or people that were affiliated with him had to buy up some of the assets because they were in debt at that point and um and then the family his parents didn't want anything to do with los angeles or anything so the business was eventually sold and then eventually all the the um, assets and everything, the products they were putting out, they quit putting them out, and Jay Sebring basically, the product fell by the wayside. One thing that I didn't know and that the documentary kind of paints a picture of is that they say that Jay Sebring's lawyer, who was a good friend of his named Greenwald, said that he had put together divorce papers for Sharon and that Sharon had had or was going to tell Roman that she wanted a divorce because her and Jay wanted to be together. And they also somewhat allude to the idea that the baby that Sharon was, was carrying with Paul was possibly Jay's. We did also find out in the, in the report, you know how I said there, there was so much misinformation in the Time Magazine and various articles throughout time that people thought, you know, all kinds of things happened in the murder that didn't happen but one thing that they did find they did definitely find out that did happen was that Jay was coming towards Tex Watson he was going to try and take on Tex Watson to fight for his life to fight for Abigail Folger and voice to everybody that was there the girl shouted to Tex that he watch out and Tex unloaded his gun on Jay hitting him once and then went over and stabbed him I think seven times so he uh you know he he went down fighting rest in peace Jay Sebring Thomas John Cummer well my friends we're gonna call it a day I hope you enjoyed today's vlog and if you didn't know anything about Jay Sebring other than he was one of the victims of the 
Manson family attacks. Hope you appreciate all that he did in his short life. Thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night and goodbye. Good